inspirational, and entertaining. One of the most talked about and progressive shows on social media. Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Welcome, welcome to Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Thank you so much for joining us on today. We have a very serious issue that we're going to share with you on today, and we want you to be in tune so you can get the information down so that you can get involved in this most important issue. But before we go into this most important issue, we want to tell you a little bit about the show. You are tuned in to Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Currently, we are broadcasting on Amazon Fire TV, Facebook, YouTube, Roku, Apple TV, Daily Gospel Network, Daily Gospel International. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart or follow us at Law Office of Sheila R. Stewart. We also want to, to let you know that the views of this show do not necessarily represent any views of any law firms or religious organizations. Organizations, excuse me. We are located at 231 South Bemiston Avenue, Clayton, Missouri, 63105. And you can reach me at law at SheilaStewart.com. Thank you so much. And today, we have a very interesting subject matter that we're going to discuss with you. And the name of this show is Setting the Captive Free. Setting the Captive Free. And we're talking about freeing an innocent man from prison, no other than Christopher or Chris Dunn. And we have with us on today his attorney, attorney Justin Bonus from New York, and Professor Kenya Brumfield Young from St. Louis University and his wife, Mrs. Kira Dunn. And they are going to give you some information about this compelling issue. I am going to introduce these guests and they are going to set the stage of what is taking place. This case is currently pending before the US Supreme Court and we are believing that Chris is gonna go free. Welcome today, how are you guys doing today? Hi, Sheila. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, before we get started, Justin, can you just set real quickly uh, the framework of what is taking place in the life of Chris today? Right. So um, Chris had an evidentiary hearing a couple of years ago um, where a judge determined that no juror would have convicted Chris had they heard the evidence that was in front of the judge. Um, there were two witnesses that testified against Chris, a 14 year old boy and a 12 year old boy. And both of those individuals as grown men now have recanted, admitted that they could never have identified Chris as a shooter. There's a young man named Rico Rogers that was killed back in 1990. Uh, and both of those men were young, young, young kids at the time, 12 and 14 years old. And they've now come forward to say that they could have never identified Chris um at a hearing um and specifically there were there were other witnesses judge took testimony from other witnesses the state presented evidence opposing chris chris's innocence and the judge determined after hearing that evidence that um that no juror would convict chris that chris is innocent that's the standard uh for innocence no reasonable juror would convict a person that's the standard for actual innocence uh and at least in most places in the United States. Um, so the judge was kind of set with a dilemma because in Missouri, the state of Missouri, um, they have a decision called Lincoln v. Cassidy. And Lincoln v. Cassidy says that actual innocence only applies, I believe it's the DNA cases and also cases where men are on death row. All right, now Chris is not a DNA case and Chris is not on death row. He received life plus 90 years. I don't know what happened to the 90 years, but he received life plus 90 years. Um, you know, so the judge said, I am hamstrung by precedent, right? 
I can't help you because of this case. All right. So the it went up to the appellate division in Missouri. Missouri. They refused to hear the case. It went to the Supreme Court, Missouri. They refused to hear the case. We then went to the Eighth Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals. Right. And we made the application that there's a case called Henry Davis and Henry Davis. It was a gentleman by the name of Troy Davis who was on death row in Georgia who was denied a hearing. And he had, I think, nine, ten witnesses. I can't remember how many witnesses. They wouldn't even give this man a hearing. He was on death row. And the Supreme Court said that you can't just toss everything out and not give somebody a hearing, especially when somebody has such a compelling case of innocence. And they ordered the United States District Court in Georgia to hold a hearing, to take evidence and hold a hearing, to take witness testimony, whatever evidence that there is that this gentleman had, Troy Davis had to present. And what they said in that Troy Davis decision is, you know, we're going to go by what the Supreme Court would go by what the district court held or found once they heard this evidence. Now, the district court ended up denying Troy Davis. Right. And then the, the case went back up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, hey, look, you had your shot. You know, you lost. See, this is what's so interesting about Chris's case is right. A judge has taken evidence. He's heard testimony, all types of testimony from alibi witnesses and independent eyewitnesses that actually confirmed that these men could have never seen. What they said that they saw a trial. Okay, an independent eyewitness guy has no criminal record. He has no dog in this race. Uh, And the judge found this man at Chris's hearing to be completely credible. All right. And that's a very, very, very big deal. So in Troy Davis's case, the Supreme Court said we have to we have to adhere to the person that heard the evidence. Right. We have to adhere to the district court. The district court heard the evidence. We have to adhere to the district court's determination. Well, in Chris's case, when we went to the Eighth Circuit, we appealed to the Eighth Circuit and said, hey, look, you know, we were requesting what's called a successive habeas petition in federal court. In federal court, you only get one chance, one real bite at the apple. So then you have to go to the appellate court and request a what's called a leave to appeal or uh, you request leave to then file another petition to the district court. So essentially the, the eighth circuit, they just denied our petition. Right. And we, we exhausted all of Chris's both state and federal remedies. And we're going to the Supreme court now. And we're saying to the Supreme court that, Hey, you said in Troy Davis's case that if a judge takes evidence and testimony and he determines that a man is innocent, then that that person, that that man should receive relief. And that's really what our petition is about, is that we are asking the Supreme Court to essentially overrule Lincoln v. Cassidy and not delineate between a man on death row or a woman on death row and somebody who's not on death row. Very simple. An innocent man should never sit in prison. I mean, that's actually like foundational for, you know, the Constitution, uh, it's just, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, the founding fathers would be rolling in their grave right now if they knew that a man that, you know, a judge said was innocent is still sitting in prison. And that's really what the, where we are right now with the petition, uh, in the Supreme court and the Supreme court has appears to be taking this very seriously and that, and they have ordered the state of Missouri to respond to our petition. Excellent. Justin, how long has Chris been in prison? Since 1990, what is it, 1990? Yes. 1990. So he's been falsely falsely in prison for over 30 years. Right. Okay. Right. And and, go ahead. I can have to care for, and I just want to piggyback off of Justin. Um, And in Missouri, we have filed House Bill 360, and that is exactly what it piggybacks on, is what Justin is talking about. It's saying that we need to expand you know, these claims to allow people who are not on death row to be able to file these freestanding claims of innocence, that they should not be restricted to just people on death row, that um, others who have 
um, the ability you know, to file these claims should be able to, that it's not okay to do this. Um, Representative Kimberly Ann Collins and I worked on this legislation together and we're hoping you know, that this session that it moves through you know, the, Missouri, the Missouri chambers. Excellent. Can you tell us the state of mind that Chris is in at this time, uh, Ms. Dunn? You are his wife and you've been married to him for several years now. Tell us about Chris. He's been in prison for 30 years for a crime he did not commit. Did not commit. Tell us how he's doing. Well, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. Um, he does his best to stay even and steady and keep the hope, but it's rough, you know, for both of us simply because we've gotten our hopes up many, many times and they've been let down many, many times. Um, so what we try to do is make a step, a positive step each day toward either getting the word out or advocating or reaching out to people who may be able to help us. Um, whether it be in the media or, you know, professors like um, like Professor Brumfield Young. We're enormously lucky to have Justin in our corner as well. So we just keep moving forward on that tip. And I wanted really quickly to piggyback on what Professor Brumfield Young said. If HB 360 had been in effect when we had that hearing in 2018, Chris would have walked free that day. Chris has had three heart attacks since that day. His health is not good, um, and I really want to get him home, of course, we all do, to be under the care of a cardiologist be before I get that call, saying that it's too late. And we hope that HB 360 proceeds forward with bipartisan support and that it's retroactive, if and when it does pass. Justin, can you tell us exactly what the Supreme Court has to, uh, directed the Missouri uh, courts to respond to? Well, so the, the, the petition that we filed is a bit unique, right? Technically, um, Chris has exhausted all of his remedies. And, 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 and 2254, which is the habeas petition in the state, it, it, it's a state habeas petition for federal court essentially allows a state inmate to go to federal court to challenge the constitutionality of a state conviction. And the, there's limitations on a habeas petition at the federal level because of the crime bill that we should all thank President Clinton for in 1996 that limited um, the habeas rights of, of a lot of people. But they what that crime bill didn't touch on is the fact that a, a prisoner can still go directly to the Supreme Court under the Supreme Court's original habeas jurisdiction. And we have to show the Supreme Court that there are extraordinary and compelling circumstances. And that's what we showed here. And the extraordinary and compelling circumstance is that this man is sitting in prison innocently. A, a, an independent judge. I mean, I don't know if I've actually really heard a judge say, hey, you're innocent. You got to go back to jail. Never really heard that one before. I I, I, I know I haven't personally, <laughs> you know. So what the Supreme Court is asking Missouri to do, and I don't understand how they're going to respond to this, because the only thing that they can really say is, hey, procedurally, Christopher Dunn is not eligible. It doesn't matter that he's innocent. It's he's not eligible. You have to understand, they can't say that Judge Hickel's wrong. I mean, they, they, I guess they can say Judge Hickel's wrong, but the Supreme Court, f with the precedent that they use, the, they give deference to the fact finder. And the fact finder in this instance, of the fact finder is a legal term, right? The fact finder could be the jury if you're in a jury trial. It could be the judge if you're in a bench trial. In a hearing, a, a hearing... When, you, when you're talking about post-conviction cases and motions to vacate a person's conviction, a hearing is essentially like a bench trial. So really the Supreme Court is going to defer to Judge Hickel's determination. And, they, and, and, and I, you know, I wish I could read the mind of what's going to go on in the AG's office, you know, but I don't know how they're going to oppose this petition other than to just say, hey, you know, there's this this precedent that if you're not on death row, then you can't be found innocent, even though Christopher Dunn's been found innocent. 
right? That he's just not eligible because he's not on death row. I think that's the most ridiculous. First of all, I think it's an it's a violation of the equal protection clause in the United States Constitution. It violates, you know, every single punishment. Right. I mean, well, I mean, that's a given. Right. But I mean, let's just talk about how we're separating. Right. Mm -hmm. People on death row from people in prison. That's equal protection. We already know that's cruel and unusual. That's basis. That's just that's a baseline thing here. But if we're going to talk about, you know, uh, we hear a lot of uh, commentary about uh, how how certain justices on the Supreme Court are what they call originalists. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness is it was the foundation of allegedly this country and and our citizens. And Christopher Dunn is most certainly a citizen of the United States of America. One of his fundamental, fundamental rights, his liberty, has been snatched, snatched away from him. Essentially, he's a hostage. You know, he's been kidnapped. And, and, and I think that that is something that everybody should really, really be concerned about. Everyone, everyone, you could be, you could eat. The process could take effect, right? The, the, our legal process could take effect, and it's not repairing itself right now. That's what the appellate process is for. Chris is being denied the ability to use the procedures that, that Missouri has established and just going all the way up even through federal court. The, the things that the, – the, the safeguards, right, that are supposed to correct the injustice – you know, once you get past the conviction, when you have a wrongful conviction, we have an appellate process. We have a po what they call post conviction process. Right. That isn't working right now. And 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 the state of Missouri, the Supreme Court's going to want to know what the state of Missouri's position is. Right. Why should Christopher Dunn not be granted relief? Like, why should he not be a free man now after a judge, an independent judge? Right. That has no dog in the race, heard the evidence, said that no juror would convict. That means he believes Christopher Dunn is innocent. Because he's a juror. He's literally t he's the person sitting there hearing the evidence and he's telling you no juror would convict. I, I, I think it's I, I, I can't tell you what Missouri is going to say. I'll be honest with you. You know, I just can't. I, you know, like, like I, I like the statement that you made. You said. Uh, cruel and unusual punishment. You said that's basic. That's a given. And that's what I can't understand. It, it's, it's so basic. Why are we here? Right. You know, I, I mean, why are we right. here? That's uh, I think it, I think it, says he's innocent. I don't. Right. I think it's an <laughs> affront. It's an it's an affront. It, it, it really is a stain in the eye of our justice system. It, I, I, Straight face, I don't know how anyone – I saw this case and I just said, look, uh, you know, I, I, I have to step in. And, and, and um, you know, I mean, it's only, it's only by God's grace that we're here, right, and, and, and sitting in front of the Supreme Court, and it appears that they're taking it very serious, as they should. They should. And, right, as they should. This, is, this won't just affect Chris. It will affect everyone in Missouri. And it will, I believe it will also affect federal inmates. Okay. Because it's, it, this is an edict. I think that they're going to have to establish a, that you can't delineate between somebody that's on death row and in, in prison for life or how many years they're in prison for. Uh, and then B, uh, they're going to have to establish a standard for actual innocence. And that is, from the Supreme Court, you know, they set the law of the land. It'll affect many, many, many people in a I good way. Can you, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, the thinking of Missouri um, responding to the U.S. Supreme Court and this bill getting through uh, the legislature in Missouri? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, we have, um, we have a very conservative legislature here. And what I am hoping is that um, there was a bill introduced um, last year in the Senate. It was introduced a little late, but it did get bipartisan support. And what that tells me is that um, while we have a very conservative legislature here, is that at least at that level, there's some sense of um, equity at that level regarding this issue. 
So what I am hoping is that it goes to our Judiciary Committee and they look and say, okay, although, um, because the other piece of, of this thing is that there was um, what the court considered in Chris's case, no procedural issue. And since there was no procedural um, issue with this case on which to overturn, that's the other part to this, right? And they'll look at this and say, okay, we can't base all of our, you know, whether or not someone has a procedural issue in order to determine whether or not they've been wrongly convicted if they're not on death row. That cannot be the litmus for this. So I'm hoping that they're able to have the same conversation with this particular bill. Although the last one started in the Senate, this one's starting in the House. I'm hoping that that same conversation, you know, perseveres and they're able to work together and say, you know what, we need to expand this because it needs to apply the same to people regardless of status. So I always remain, you know, cautiously optimistic. I've learned to never predict, you know, our legislature, our jury, mm -hmm. or the bench. I have, you know, that's just my rule of thumb. Um, you know, but I'm willing to have conversations with people. I'm willing to, um, you know, further, ex you know, expand, you know, explain and have you know, dialogue, open dialogue with people if, if they've got questions. But that's where, you know, that's where my hope is. But that's the other piece to this, you know, Lincoln v. Cassidy that a, a, other, a lot of people don't get is that they look and say, oh, there, there was not a procedural issue in this case. So since there was no procedural issue, there's nothing we can do. And he, you know, Chris isn't the, the only one who has been bound by this. There's several cases in Missouri, in which people were caught under the thumb of this case. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, this will give some other folks that meet the standard some reprieve. So Justin, if Missouri, if the Missouri respond and say, we have to follow precedent here, can't the U.S. Supreme Court make, you know, overturn that decision? And Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they could say that Lincoln v. Cassidy is unconstitutional, period. Right. They and can so, easily do it. it. I don't understand why they just didn't do that. I mean, do you do you think it's because they're conservative? Uh, no, I think that they, you know, um, when you talk about procedure, the other side always gets a crack, right? And and that's just that's just the nature of the system is they always mm -hmm. ask for a response to hear what Missouri has to say. Um, you know, and, and that's that, I mean, that's, um, usually it's normal, normal practice for the opposing party to respond. And they, to be honest with you, they shouldn't really be an opposing party here, but I mean, that's, uh, that's the scary part, right? Yeah. They're prosecutors. So, um, it is their nature, uh, to respond. Um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the way it goes. Usually there's a response, there's a response after there's a petition and then there's a reply sometimes. So, I mean, I, I don't put any stock in, um, you know, the, I, I think it's a good thing, uh, it, because it is my understanding that, uh, there are many times that these petitions don't even need a response, that they can make a decision without having a response. The fact that they are requesting a response actually, um, uh, is 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 a positive thing. Well, we're looking for a positive response from um, the Missouri courts. Kira, can you just give us um, your thoughts for the future for Chris? What is his, What is he hoping that his future will look like? He'll get out and restoration and his health. Right. He, um, once he is out, hopefully would like to reach back and help other people who have a strong innocence claim who are in his situation or who do come home after a long ex uh, process of exoneration, many years behind bars, helping them get reestablished. Um, but also the youth. He's always had a soft spot for young people who are caught up in the system at a very young age mm -hmm. and giving them a second chance to really turn things around before it's too late. Um, he's seen these things happen to family members, to people he grew up with 
in that neighborhood who, um, I mean, it's, it's almost like they're an endangered species in that neighborhood. He has so few men his age that are still alive, even. Um, the ones that are, you know, have been through the prison system, most likely. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's something very near and dear to his heart to try to help others once he is home and has time to heal and, you know, get a strong base established here. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to wrap this up. I would like for you to have the last few words, Justin, uh, regarding the case and um, your analysis and hope or hope that it will turn out very favorable for Chris. Well, you know, I think um, we could go on about the facts of the case and I, I, the facts are well established here. Uh, you know, I think it, it, Chris highlight, there's a lot of things that are highlighted in a, in, in a case like Chris's um, where you have a, a, a man that goes to trial when he's a teenager and a trial that lasts a day. And the only piece of evidence against him is a 12 year old and a 14 year old. And the 14 year old is looking at many, many years in prison. Um, and, and you know, uh, I've never really seen a transcript as short as Christopher Dunn's. Um, he was quickly uh, chewed through the system. Um, and it is no surprise that these men now have recanted. Uh, it is no surprise that there was a litany of alibi evidence that proves that Chris is innocent. And and, it, and the alibi evidence is corroborated. And it's just not just family members that are alibi evidence either. Okay. There are many people that have come forward and said that Chris Dunn was not out there that night when the, the shots were fired, where this, this young man, Rico Rogers, was killed. But not only that, we have an independent eyewitness who's never been in trouble with the law. Um who is corroborating the recantations of the, of the two men that have now said that we lied. We lied at trial uh, and we had a reason to lie. You know, we were motivated by coercion from the police. We were motivated by the fact that we had our own issues. Um, and you have all of this evidence and it just goes to show you how difficult it is um, to win when you're innocent, even when you're innocent. You know, and I, I think it's this case is really, really heartbreaking to me because Chris proved he was innocent and um, the lawyer put on a great case. Ken Gibson, he, 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 he did everything he had to do. The lawyer that, that handled his post conviction motion did everything he had to do and he won. And I've been in the same position as Kent. You win and then you lose like it, it, ultimately he won and Chris is still in prison. Right. And I, I think that's really something that I pray to God every night about is, is that the Supreme Court will do justice. This, this is, this is the, this is, this is what our system is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be able to correct its mistakes. Right. And, we, and it is, it's very painful that we have to go to the United States Supreme Court to seek justice where Missouri could have easily done this themselves. Okay. And, and I think that that really, that truly should haunt everybody right now that's in Missouri, but it also should, it, it, this isn't just a, uh, it, this isn't a black issue or white issue. This is an everyone issue. Cause this could be you. That's the biggest thing is people think it can't be them. Right. And, and unfortunately for the most part, most men are black that this happens to. And, and, and the problem that I have is there's not enough care by a majority of the people. Everyone should be, everyone should care. This should strike right at your heart. You should be, you should say in your mind, you know, actually Joe Rogan said this. How could this happen? Joe Rogan talked about this on his show. How could this happen? Everyone should ask how, how this could happen. And I'll tell you, the Supreme Court should fix it. They should, this shouldn't, it shouldn't even should, they must fix it. They must fix it. And I, and that's why I don't necessarily uh, care for the response back. This is so right. egregious. It is so egregious that it should just be fixed and the young, and the young man should be able to uh, go home 
without right. waiting e even longer for a response. You have been tuned into Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. I want to thank my special guest for being with us on today. I am going to ask you to come back after the Missouri courts respond. Please come back. Let's address it again. And let's keep this issue in front of the people. Bring Chris Don home. Thank Amen. you. And tune in to be with us on next week. Thank you and have a great evening.